I threw at you sure. earlier about uh, you doing this movie uh, at the time when rom-com was king and now you're going to put it out when the trend is horror thriller you're ahead of your time what do you think about that you know it's interesting because every time i make a movie i tr i don't follow the trends i'm never i never see what's working what's selling i just make the movies that i feel like this is a compelling story whether it's trendy or not people are going to watch it so that's why with way of the cross even break my previous movie i just said you know what i want to make a movie that's actually kind of controversial where cultures clash but it actually brings up things that people don't like to talk about you know and then that's why it has it carries a life of its own on its way so in terms of trends though don't you i don't i would love to like i don't know like now it's the superhero trend you know it's obviously who's going to make their superheroes is, a, is an ip you have to convert i was like if i want to make a superhero i would want to create an original superhero type of movie you know so i try not to follow trends i just do what i feel like is a great story to tell and see how people perceive it we were talking about this movie uh, because this has been in production for many years now, right? It, uh, about a year and a half. About a year yeah. and a half. So just to give a background there, what is it about? So, Way the Cross deals with uh, a Phil Lamb who's half Filipino, half American, who is actually a top FBI agent in America. What happens is that his uh, Filipino father, who is a top NBI agent in the Philippines, dies. So he, and he's the father and the son have an estranged relationship. They only he only got to know his father through Christmas gifts or uh, uh, birthday parties. Is because his mother actually had divorced his father and he, she took the son to America mm -hmm. and moved to America. So what happens is that when Rogelio, my character Rogue, goes back to bury his dead father, he gets mixed up in a series of murders that happens based on the Stations of the Cross. That's a serial killer murder and his FBI instincts click in, even though he has no jurisdiction in Philippines because he's FBI, he's not NBI. But he feels like he has to do something and he gets tangled up inside this story of murders. That's the generalization of the whole story. Tell me about the title. I think it's... So, way, way of the cross it's very strong in a catholic sense in that that's the basis of right. the faith yes so it's it's interesting my father is actually the one that came up with the title mm -hmm. for the film because my father was a uh, was an altar boy when he was younger uh -huh. and so he we the uh, original title movie was stations on the cross but we're like you know what to put it put a spin on it let's call it way of the cross you know so what ended up happening was that my father, growing up as an altar boy, took a lot of the, the teachings that happened. And it was based on an original concept from Gorio Vicuña. We read his script, we read his concept, but for the international market, we had to, me and my father had to rewrite the script and adjust it. And we wrote it for the international markets. Uh, selling points. So, but in terms of you're talking about the title way of the cross, it came from my father uh, seeing that there's the controversy between the church and a lot of the priests getting away with pedophilia, you know. But it kind of deals with that, and we're like, you know, let's try to do a, a murder mystery around the stage of the cross, and we'll call it way of the cross, and see how controversial or how people that are very faithful like the Philippines because it's a big, big faith country. Let's see how they receive it. And I think they will receive it fine. Alright. Uh, and the process of this movie, how it looks and the choosing of the characters. Oh, the, the characters and the actors too, the talent? Well, um, when I first made Break and I came back here, when I first made Break and I saw that uh, all the people I hooked up with, you know, a lot of the local productions and everything, I was just like, you know what, I want to see how making a film in the Philippines, let me, let me test my muscle because I made, it's, I, I made a project in Japan, I made a project in America, so I was like, let me try to make something in the Philippines with the local talent here. And so we we actually had all the all the actors audition. I don't care if it was Roxanne Barcelo, Alvin Alvin Anson, Rafael. I was like, I just want to audition you. I'm not going to give you guys the part because I want to see if you guys are right for the role, regardless of your status. And they did an awesome job. And we actually wrote each character based on the, the character we're looking for. And through the audition process, each of these characters fit that profile that we wanted, which is a blessing in disguise. So that's that's how we got it with the local talent. How's the working with the local talent? Oh, it's, 
I told um I told Elaine this too. It was it's it's one of the it was one of the greatest experiences I've, I've had in the Philippines because um comparing it to like my shooting in Japan. I, oh my God, you can get a, you can't get away with a lot of things in Japan that you can do in um, in the Philippines or even in America. In Japan, for example, if I want to shoot like in this location, I have to close down the street. I have to register three months in advance, saying we want to close down the street on this date to record. And they're saying, okay, you have to fill out this paperwork process, blah blah blah, get permits. And then three months come by, but if it's snowing or raining, and we're like, but the scene doesn't say snow or rain. They're like, sorry, you gotta film it or you gotta reprocess again. Or in the Philippines, I was like. Can we uh can we close down the street? Oh yeah, let's do it right now. And I was like, oh wow. I was like, okay. And I was like, uh, can we uh can I can I go in the church and just film? He's like, yeah. And they just bring the camera up there, and, and the priest is in his thing. We're filming the priest, you know. So, but the thing I liked about the Philippines a lot, filming more, was that I was able to. They get a lot of. There are a lot of Western humor. I like ban I like bantering with the the, the the cast and crew. You know, compared to Japan, they're very concealed. They don't like to joke around too much and everything like that. And the language barrier. Mm -hmm. At least here, everybody in the Philippines, if you know if I don't speak Tagalog, they speak English. So I was like, oh man, I feel like I can. It's a big weight left. I don't have to go through a translator. I translate it, and it takes double the time of making the movie. But I mean, I, that's why I'm going into production. My next movie, I'm making another film in the Philippines, probably in November. That's why I was just like, you know what? I love filming here. I want to make my next movie again here. I have my other project planned, and I'm going into pre-production probably July. What does it mean when you have to rewrite something for an international audience? For an international market? Yeah. Yeah, for an international market, it's like, for example, we, a lot of the, the things where we saw for the original script were very, if you want to talk about horror movie, this it felt like a cannibalism horror movie that we watched the concept and we're like, this is okay, this is a niche audience, you know, I mean, I'm sure it'll go for like somewhere here, but people probably in like Europe, Italy, France, will not understand like some of the customs of each country, you know what I'm saying? That's why I had to adapt Break. Like when I was filming Break, people were saying, oh, but we would never do that in Japan. I was like, I, I know this is not, you wouldn't do it in Japan, but because I'm showing it into international markets, where, it's, where it can be a global, where everybody that watches it, that understands church, you know, and everything like that, they'll be able to say, oh, okay, I get it. It's not just for that country that I have to be from that country to understand it. I can understand it just by watching it, even if I don't understand the language, you know what I'm saying? So that's what we mean by international markets. Like, whether it resonates with audiences or not, that's up to them, but the markets is where we're trying to branch where you you watch a movie and no matter what language is in, you get the story. You know? When I first came across the title, I thought it would be about demonic possession. <laughs> because of the cross and all that so yeah. it's good for you to point out that it's really more thriller drama yes and it deals with the characters it's very characters like every character in here is a, a humanistic character where everybody can relate to them it's not because if it was dem demonic or something like that it's kind of a fantasy where people are like oh it's good you know it, it's i don't not knocking fantasy but when i can have audiences relate to characters and say like man that's yeah i would do that too or i can actually go through the story i can see why he did that that's where i got the audience and then i'm like okay now i got you now let me take you on this journey of the story you have to sell the audience on believing if that because when the audiences go see a movie they see themselves in their care in that character that's right. what i want audiences to feel it's like i can see myself in that character even though i'm not buff a superhero I like his, I would, I would, I can relate to him. I can. So that's what I try to do with all the characters in my movies. Be relatable. Are there action scenes? There are action scenes. There's a, a small fight scene and a chase scene in there. It's not much of a big giant action movie or something that it deals with the characters in drama and thriller. That's what we're going for. And then you uh, mentioned earlier that uh, you are eyeing Netflix for this, for streaming platforms for this? Right, right. Um, We're trying to look and get into Amazon Prime, Netflix, uh, iFlix, and yeah, and uh, possibly iTunes as well. We can do the iTunes uh, streaming services. And can you repeat about uh, your observation about the decline in theater and everyone going into watching movies on phone? Okay. So yeah, we, everybody, especially now, especially with all the blockbusters taking up a lot of the theater space, it's very hard for, for 
small movies or independent movies or even smaller budget movies that are not even can't even reach that level of production to get people to watch it. So what we did was that we were trying to reprogram the model, the business model of trying to show instead of going to theaters, which is like a cherry on top, we're just going to show it to a lot of the streaming services where all we want is eyeballs to look at it because that's where that's where we can get audiences because you can only fit so many people in the theater and how many how long the movie's in there what two months or something like that but if it's on streaming netflix or uh, all these streaming services it's there for a year or two years depending on the contract everybody can re-watch it they can watch it the way that they want to do anywhere they want they don't have to go to a theater to watch they can just sit here at a restaurant and watch it too so that's why we we're more about the eyeballs compared to like where it, where it First, plays. Yeah. Did working your with your father make this an easy or difficult experience? <laughs> um, I want to say, you know, I'm just kidding. I was going to say <laughs> a difficult experience because every time in front of Ken, he's directing me. It was just like, no, it's not good enough. You have to do it again. I'm just like, you know, he's my dad. But the uh, cool thing is my father was an actor growing up back in L.A., back in the 70s. But that was a time when the minorities weren't getting roles. You know, it was very hard for an Asian or a Southeast Asian or anybody of color to get roles in Hollywood. So what happened was that my father, growing up, when he saw that I have a love for movies, that's where he said, you know what, I want to, I want to see if I can harness his, his vision. Let me show him what I learned and try to package that. And then I want to teach him how to just like, who cares about trying to make it like, try to sell a movie for the, for America or the white man. Why don't you go over to Asia, take care, take advantage of your Asian traits and make a film about your your culture, your family, your everything. And then it's like what we call the Bruce Lee model. You know, Bruce Lee wasn't famous. He didn't become famous until he went back to Hong Kong and he got big. And then America was like, well, we want you. You're so big because he wasn't respected in America. Then that's when he came back to America. He's like, all right, if you want me, these are my terms now. I need to, I want to film like this. So that's kind of the business model that I'm running into. So that's what my dad's trying to mold me into. And that's what Kaizen Studios is trying to do right now. Has it crossed your mind to stay longer in the Philippines and maybe invest more in a career here? Yes, yeah. We were actually looking into opening up uh, Kaizen Studios here. Like, okay. remember, every time we, so every time we make a movie here, we have a, I have a group of people that I, I can trust in the talent. I can trust the crew. I was like, they know how I work. They know how, what I like, you know, and they, they know my workflow, so it's easy for them, you know. So that's why I have, I have five other movies planned, but yeah, and I have like two of them ready to shoot in the Philippines, so that's why I think it would be easier if I open up a production uh, house here, Kaizen Studios, so where I can like, every time I want to make a movie here, I can just plug and go. There's this thing going on in local cinema in that if a movie doesn't do well in the first two days, they pull it out. What do you think of that? Yeah, I heard about that from, I think, Alvin Anson. He had a movie, he filmed a movie there, and he said that if he was trying to get people to watch it, and be, if it wasn't hitting a certain threshold or something like that, they got pulled. Honestly, that is, that's unfortunate. I really think that's that's sad, because a lot of the talent and hard work went into making that movie, and then nobody's going to watch it, which is why we come back to the streaming service. It's like, I want to dictate what I, my future about, like, I don't want to have to dictate to the studios, like, put my movie if no one's going to, watch it you get to pull it no it's like i'm gonna put it on the streaming services where everybody's gonna be able to watch it whenever they want to for free technically you know without uh without with the service and they can pause stop and watch the movie on their home systems when the comfort of their own homes but the theater in terms of like i did you know when i heard about that i was just like Maybe they have to change that business model. That's why I was like, we need, the business model needs to change like that. Because I don't know if it's the same elsewhere. Is it? Yeah. Like in the U.S., is that how they do it? If it doesn't no, that's not how they. No, do it. yeah, in the U.S., there's they do it. They go through a special screening process of what movies they feel like are going to sell. So they 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 only bank on movies that have like a certain movie star or credibility or a backing. How much marketing money is going into the movie? That's what determines what goes into the theaters. It's not much like any movie can get into the theater, you know. And you have to have a special what kind of what kind of movie you have to sell them on it. So that's yeah, it's not the same in America. How did you prepare for your role? For Rogue? I actually have a my uncle is actually friends with an FBI agent in America. So I got to shadow him for a week in the at um, at, with him going to work and seeing how he how he carries himself a little bit like that even 
Does he put his gun here, here, here? You know, just little details like that. So that was just like the bulk of the train, the bulk of the role is just trying to get in the mindset of an FBI agent. But also I did some training, just like some uh, obstacle shooting training, just to get a feel for my character. But in terms of training, that's that's the base of it. Is the storytelling straightforward or is the movie big on ambiance? Is it big on symbolisms maybe or... I mean, that's, I, I want to say that it is big on all those things you said, Jojo, but yeah, it's, I feel like everybody that watches it is going to get a different take from it. It's not one of the things like, like, uh, you know, I just at the top of my head because we were talking about it, Avengers. It's like, okay, I know what's going to happen here. The Avengers, some of the Avengers, especially in Vanguard, they're going to die. Okay, so they are just, we're just waiting until we get that. Or Titanic. I know the ship's going to sink. I just want to see when the ship's going to sink. You know, it's like, I, I don't like those movies where you can know the ending, you know. I rather, I rather watch a movie right here where it's like, oh, I, I didn't expect that. Or like, I, it's not, I didn't expect the character to do that. So I try to keep the audience... Uh, on a hill, on an, in, on an inclined hill, so they're like, oh, 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 okay, you know. I, I hate when the audience knows what's coming. I really don't like that. I try to su surprise them. I think you're also um, a businessman, aside from uh, being an actor and director, in the sense that that you should know when something is marketable or when. Um, but how do you assess? Um, Filipino culture uh, so that you can pattern your work to its taste you know I think uh, when we first started making this movie and I came into auditioning the, uh, auditioning the actors and, get, and getting to know the crew and everything like that I saw a lot of different, a lot of similarities too, but a lot of things I was like, oh, okay, I see now what I can, I see what the Filipinos are really strong at, you know, they're really strong at especially like speaking my language, they know about the creative, the creative camera work. I worked with a great DP on this movie, A.B. Garcia, that really understood my my father's eye to know that. So, in terms of trying to hone it, like for example, when we auditioned. If I, you know, it's, it's the same thing with Japan. It was like when we auditioned some of the actors, they were really expressive in their audition. Like they went from zero to a hundred in like five seconds we're like oh whoa, whoa okay that's we're not at a stage play you know this is not theater there's not a guy sitting in the back you have to he has to hear you this is the camera you know we got you you know i want to film your face your facial reaction for you barely just give me that little smolder or that wink and then we'll know what you're thinking rather than having to express it you know right so a lot of the actors a lot of the characters we really had to hone them into like we want you to act this certain way you know like for the movie we don't want you to over express with yourself because your eyes is going to tell everything your emotions are going to tell everything not your yelling because you're angry or crying because you're sad i want to see it in your eyes so that was the main thing with working with the local talent here was actually honing them in on how to act in a certain way that fits the story and every and that's how I was trained in America was trying to be like where less is more type of thing you know are you thinking of screening the movie in other countries yes we actually have a screening probably next month or two in Japan oh. yeah and then after that we're going to America and then America is where I have my connections where they're going to go on Amazon Prime Netflix in Japan we're looking into getting into their streaming services over there too so I know this this movie is going to be a lot of Japanese too. We're trying to see how well this movie will do in Japan because it deals with a lot of church and the Japanese are very like religious in terms of Catholicism or Christianity. They're more for uh, uh, I forgot what the word was, but they're more into Buddha too and stuff like that. So, but again, like I said, everybody that watches whether they're religious or not can feel because it's not deals with religion as an umbrella. Where I want you guys to focus on the characters. Religion's just the backdrop. It's just the backdrop of these characters. Did you work on this movie continuously? I mean, it took a year and a half, um, but in the Philippines, you could churn out a movie in three months' time. I know, that's... I was actually writing other movies while working on this movie. So I that's see. why I was making sure that while I was working on this movie, I was actually come developing, writing other movies. That's why I can go into pre-prod for my next movie in the Philippines in July. I was making sure I had stuff in the background. That's why I had five other movies planned. So I was like, okay, once this takes off, I can work on start churning out these other movies because I have so many other movies I want to tell. It's just this one was my first four-way into the Philippines. That's why it was a little, little, because especially since I didn't direct it and my father co-directed and came in later, I was like, okay, I have to try to make some of this work, you know, because it's not the way that, it's not for the international market. Let me see if I can try to make this 
I have to edit it a certain way, you know. But I actually had other projects planned and developed before I started uh, finishing this movie. One of the things neglected uh, in making movies is the sound, the music, the scoring. Yes. How did you ensure that it won't happen to you here? Oh, you're gonna you're gonna hear it, Jojo. When you guys watch the movie, I had a, I worked with a great composer. Uh, that took a lot of my pegs. I gave him pegs of, of other movies. I said, I want you to follow this tone and everything like that. And, and my composer is Alvin Cornista. He actually filmed, he's actually from Canada, but he's a Filipino. He moved here, he's uh, from Canada. So he took a lot of the music and he's a musician. So he could, I could speak his language about saying, I want it to sound like this, can you crescendo up here more, crescendo down here more. So he really had that taste of like what I was going for in this movie. And the, the score is so awesome. It's really one of the, it's like another character in the film. I really appreciate the score and dedication of me and him working together. But I agree, Jojo, like sound is neglected. And I feel like that's, I feel like it's 50% when, or more. When in fact. Yeah, it's more important to the movie because you can watch a movie and if the picture sucks but the sound is good, you, it's forgiving. Right. But if the picture's beautiful and everything but the sound sucks, I'm walking out of the theater, right. you know. It's less because it, I can't hear what, what did the characters say, what did the dialogue, you know. So that's the thing that I was I learned in film school in, in Hollywood was invest in sound. Sound is really important. It's not about the camera, what camera size, 8K, 7K you're shooting. Get a good sound editor and get a good sound live sound recorders. That's like the thing you should invest in first. Uh, my last question, are there Pinoy industry players you'd like to work with? Pinoy uh, actors and actors? Actors or directors or... Oh man, you know, there's a lot of local talent I would love to, I'd love to work with. Like, I'm a big fan. One of the first uh, Filipino movies I watched was, uh, uh, shoot, uh, who's, uh, Jojo, who did, who did, Eric Mati, he did, um, what's that movie, his, his first movie? On the Job? On the Job, there we go. That was one of the first Filipino movies I saw on the Job, and I, I fell in love with Eric Mati's style right there. I was like, man, this feels really cool, you know, very gritty, my style. That's the type of style I love, I love to make. And I would just love to see how he would, you know, I just love to talk to him just to see how he would do uh, what I would talk to him about. But in terms of uh, actors and talent, let's see. Um, shoot. I mean, a lot of these actors I worked with here were a blessing that I would love to work with them again. I would love to work with them again. But I haven't watched, uh, let me see, I guess. Um, <laughs> Liza Soberano was a, was a name that popped up. Yeah, I was like, I would love to work with her. And um, let's see, there's another one too. I, I recently watched Buy Bust with uh, Ann Curtis. And I thought she did a great job in that one too. And there's, uh, I mean, I don't know, man. There's a lot. There's a lot I can list right now, but yeah. Those ones, but mostly the, I would love to see my way to the Cross family again. I would love to see them again in the movie, but that's it. Thank you.